Scripture reading this morning is uh, Joshua 7, verse 1. If you're following along, that's Joshua 7, verse 1. But the sons of Israel acted unfaithfully in regards to the things under the ban. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, from the tribe of Judah, took some of the things under the ban. Therefore, the anger of the Lord burned against the sons of Israel. Morning again, church. It's good to see everyone this morning once again. Uh, it's been a busy weekend. We had, once again, uh, the last leaders convention where we had a lot of our, our youth go up and, or go down, which way? Up, up. And uh, they, did, they did great. They, they put forth the work and everything else. And for that, the, they'll, they'll share all that with you. There's no doubt about that. Uh, Mr. Kevin, uh, I can tell halfway through there was something going on with him. And uh, I figured out by the end of last night, I'm like, are you going to be okay? And he's like, I don't feel good. And so I said, why don't you go rest and everything else? I said, are you going to be able to do tomorrow? He's like, yeah, I'm good. I went, okay. Five minutes later, I'm not good, man. This is not good at all. <laughs> I said, that's okay. I said, I, instead of leaving tomorrow, I'll leave tonight and I'll, I'll get things situated. And so I said, just don't stress about that. You rest in your hotel room and then come home and, and Lord willing, we will see each other when you get here. And so uh, he is currently on his way uh, back. And so for that, just keep him also in your prayers. He says he feels a lot better today. And I said, well, I, I was up late, so I'm doing the sermon regardless. <laughs> so, right. Uh, but thank you for, for your prayers, for the safe travel of they return back. Uh, this morning, I know it's, it's kind of different. You got people expecting certain sermons at uh, certain holidays, don't we? With resurrection and everything else. Uh, when we come together as the Lord's church, we, we memorialize and remember the Lord's death every first day of the week. Amen. We come here and we remember that. You know, I'm thankful. You know, I know he has risen every day, right? And I'm reminded of that. And so uh, I think a lot of times we get, we fixated on one day when in reality it's our life, right? You know, I, I, as a Christian, that's what we live by. As a Christian, I know he, he has risen because all the great things that he's done in my life and probably yours as well. And so we kind of take a different turn when it comes to these kind of what they call traditional services when it comes to, you know, these lessons. And me, I go, hey, we're going to keep doing what we've been doing, right? We're going to keep going. If anything, let's, let's talk about something that is usually not talked about a lot. And there's no doubt that there's a lot of subjects like that. But there is things out there that is always going to happen if we're not careful. One of those things is sin, right? You can't escape it. it. It's going to be there. You strive not to fall in that temptation of the devil's snare, but sin is going to happen. In fact, Romans 3.23, it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so that is something that we cannot escape. And we see there that in Romans 6.23 that the wages of sin is death. And this has been around since the dawn of time, since the beginning, has it not? There's always been a sin problem in the world, and those are things that we have to discuss and be on guard about. What I think is interesting is that if we're not careful, here's what's happened. It gets to the point where today people don't want to talk about sin. They don't want to talk about it. They don't want to talk about sin. And when I'm talking about sin, I'm talking about things that goes against God's word or transgression against God's law, right? The actual word for sin is missing the mark, like as if a, an archer was aiming at a target and, and it, it missed. That's what we're talking about today. And we're talking about sin and, and how it is a problem and how we can overcome that problem. And if we're not careful, we see a lot of what happens today is that all of a sudden we have sin that enters into the church and instead of maybe handling it eventually or getting to it or discussing it, we're, we're too scared to bring it up because we don't want to offend people, right? Right? I know that's the case a lot of times. And I think the problem is a lot of times a lot of people, whenever they hear Christians, they have a very sometimes a, a jaded view with Christians, don't they? You know, whenever I say, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a minister or a preacher, people kind of look at me and they kind of, oh, and <laughs> step back, Right? <laughs> As if I have something that I can, you know, I, I'm, I'm just going to encourage. That's what I'm going to do. That's, that's what I'm about. But sadly, they might have had a bad experience with Christians. And all of a sudden, if we're not careful, that bleeds over to us. And they do that before they even get to know us, don't they? 
Absolutely they do. And so that's why a lot of times whenever I discuss subjects like this, I got to go, hey, if we're not careful, some things might come into the church and we just don't deal with it. And then all of a sudden the church falls. Can that happen? What we see in Revelation, absolutely. That's why it was called the dead church, is it not? That all of a sudden they, they allow certain things and you got the corrupt church and everything else. And, and God didn't talk favorably about them. And so these are things we need to at least be on guard about and think about. Going back to the uh, verse that was read to us, you got here in Joshua chapter 7. It says there in verse 1, it says, But the children of Israel committed a trespass regarding the accursed things for Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, the tribe of Judah, took the accursed things, so the anger of the Lord burned against... you have your verse there? Burned against Achan? The children of Israel. Now you parents, do you ever do the shotgun effect? Do you know what that means? That's not like what my grandpa used to do and say, we're going to go shoot the shotgun, right? That's a whole different thing. But a shotgun effect is whenever you know that you need to make a correction with one child, sometimes we just say, all right, everyone come in. We're not going to mention names. But if you are in charge of this, maybe we need to do better at this. It's a shotgun effect, a shotgun discipline. And we do that quite a bit. But with, with the Lord, why is he angry here? Why is he angry at the children of Israel? Why is he angry at Achan? Well, to give some context here, what's going on? Go back there to Joshua chapter 6. We got a little bit of information here. A little bit more information to what is going on. Look over there in Joshua chapter 6 verse 18 and 19. And it says, And you, by all means... Abstain from the accursed things. So this is now the children of Israel. They're in the middle of conquering the promised land. And they're getting to Jericho, right? This fortified city. I mean, the walls are huge and everything else. And God's going to deliver Jericho to them. And they're going to have it. This is a mighty... I mean, people know about Jericho. They know good and well about Jericho. But the great part is that you had spies that went in there beforehand. And guess what the people's reaction is already? They're already scared of the children of Israel. Why? Because they're like, we heard about Egypt. We heard about the Red Sea. We heard about all those things. We know not to go against you or your God, right? So they're already scared. God's going to deliver them to this, this city with, without any hassle. But they have to do what God says. And so because of that, we see that there's also rules that when, when Jericho falls, when the walls come tumbling down, there were certain things that they need to make sure that they were doing. Not only to make sure that the walls come down, but also afterwards. So then you get here. It says, and you, by all means, abstain from the accursed things, lest you become what? Accursed. When you have taken the accursed things and make it in the camp of Israel, a curse and trouble it. But all the silver, look at here. It says, all the silver and all the gold, all the vessels of bronze and iron are consecrated to the Lord and they shall come into the treasury of the Lord, right? So those things that, you know, the, the, the splendors or the, the, you know, the conquering of this, all the, what you would say, valuable things, God is saying, listen, don't take those things. They're, they're going to end up in the treasury of the Lord, you know, but don't take these accursed things lest you curse the camp of Israel. So it was very plain. It was very much told to the whole entire camp that, hey, we're going to conquer this city. God's going to deliver us this city. But when we get in there, stay away from these things. They're going to go to a certain place. And that's very clear. So then all of a sudden you get to Joshua 7, 1, guess what happens? Achan's like, ooh, I like that. Right? Ooh, did you see? Do you look at this garment? Beautiful. And he took it. And he took it. And because of that, that's why God is angry. Because God very much said, don't do it. Don't do it. They did an experiment a while back. And, I, and we recreated it in my town. And you know what a flash mob is? That's where all of a sudden you look like you're in a normal situation. All of a sudden all these people are starting to sing and everything else. And you have actors come out. And all of a sudden you're, you're part of a, a production number that you didn't know you were part of. Right? We stuck a button. A red button in the middle of the square. And it says a sign. Do not push. <laughs> Y'all, they push that button all the time. That's like going into an elevator. We just had a whole bunch of the little ones. I think I had, I had uh, uh, Ronald and Harlan and I, uh, Caleb and everything else. Guess what's the first thing all those little ones want to do when they get in the elevator? I, I got control of the button. 
So after talking to the friendly person on the other end of the, the line that was front desk when they wanted to know if we needed help because they hit the call button <laughs> instead of the room number, and when she says, hi, front desk, can I help you? And I went, yes. <laughs> It's chaos, but it's fun, right? We had a blast. And so Caleb finally, you know, was hitting a button. It was, it was a great time. But what, what do you, we see buttons. Even if it says do not push, we push it. God said, don't take those things. They can took. He took of these accursed things. He, I guarantee you, what do we see the motivation? He thought of only himself. He thought it wouldn't hurt anything. And what did he do later on? He hid it so no one else would see it. So that kind of gives you the mindset there. Achan ultimately went against God's directions, even though he knew. Achan's t temptation, there, sin has a progress. Do you know what I mean by that? Look over there in, in James chapter 1, verse 14. I want to encourage you. Open your Bibles this morning. I don't want you to take my word for it. I don't want you to be like, well, Dustin said. No, look in the Bible with me. Look at it. Make sure that you're seeing the same thing that I'm seeing here. Okay, open those Bibles up. James chapter 1, verse 15, or 14 and 15. It says, but each one is tempted whenever he's drawn away by his own desires and is enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. You know, it's a progress. you got that temptation, right? But where does the temptation come from? From being enticed by something. Right? It's that enticement that, that, oh, that's temptation. And then all of a sudden it will progress that if you don't remove yourself from the temptation, what happens? You give in. The enticement, red button. Do not push. I mean, it's right there though. Now I'm tempted to push the button. I'm gonna, it, it won't hurt anybody. It won't do anything wrong. If we're not careful, we're like that. Why does a mouse trap work? I'm going to be honest. I don't like mouse traps at all. At all. Not because I just, I've had bad experiences with mouse traps and snapping on your finger and everything. I don't care for it. There's got to be another way. I got to be another way. I'm sure there are. But why does a mouse trap work? I'm going to tell you, don't use cheese. Use peanut butter. But it works. I promise you. But why does it work? A mouse, when he sees it, nose hits, it sees it, and then all of a sudden it's enticed. There's the temptation to take, and then, is that not what sin is a lot of times? And sometimes it's just like that when it snaps, when all of a sudden you are now full-fledged into sin. That's what happens, is what we see. Sin is always going to be a problem. And so with Achan, we, see, we, can, almost, we can almost see and empathize with him. Like, oh, I've been there, Achan. Maybe you've had your own struggles. Maybe you have to deal with your own temptations. Remove yourself from that. Remove yourself from the enticement. He saw the desired objects. He coveted them in his heart. And Achan ultimately acted upon this temptation and took the objects. And he hid them and he kept it in secret. You know what's interesting? There's a similar passage over in, in the New Testament. Keep your marker there. Keep a little binder there. Grab, grab a visitor card and stick it right there. Go over to 1 Corinthians for me, chapter 5. We see a similar thing happen. You know, the Lord's church is very specific on what is supposed to be doing, what they're supposed to be doing, and how they're conducting things and everything else. Paul's writing to the church at Corinth, and there in chapter 5 of verse 1, Paul has to address a, a difficult subject with them. I mean, I know Corinth had issues, but there, there's a couple of things. And so Paul says, hey, it's been reported to me that we need to, we need to take care of this. And so there in chapter 5, verse 1, it says, It is actually reported that there is there's sexual immorality among you, and such sexual morality that's not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife. And Paul says, listen, we've we got to deal with this. This is, this is going on within the church. We, have we not talked to the brother? Have we not encouraged this brother? Have we not reached out? And he said, listen, this is, this is not just a... This is widely known that this is wrong. <laughs> What are we doing about that? Are we doing anything about it? Are we reaching out to that individual? And so he goes, this is what's reported to me, that a man has his father's wife. And that's not right. That's not right. That needs to be dealt with. And so that's what you have here. All of a sudden, you have a man who is with his father's wife. I mean, that, that is something that um, is just not heard of. 
And it not, should not be. And there's definitely, we see a scripture against that. Uh, he made even a statement, it's not even heard among the Gentiles. I mean, they even know, right? The people who don't know better, know better. And, and we see that quite a bit when it comes to sin. It's all, supposedly this act, once again, is rejected by all. So then the question is, why are you still allowing this? Why are we not helping? Why are we not talking? Why are we not encouraging? And that's what we see. A lot of times we might see something and we, we do have patience and everything else. But sometimes we get in the mindset, we're like, well, we're just not going to talk about it. That's none of my business. Well, I understand the mentality there. I do. I do. But if you love somebody and you see someone struggling with sin, I mean, that's like someone all of a sudden playing in the street and you see a truck coming. Am I going to be like, man, I, they, they should really move? Um, but that's none of my business. Do you love that person? You say, hey, come here. I'm going to talk to you. There's a truck coming. It's, it's judgment day. Let's get out of the road. Let's talk for a minute. And a lot of times we just don't have the courage to kind of sit and have a conversation anymore with people. And we got to work on that ultimately. I think we do because we ultimately love them. Sin enters into the church all the time. And if we're not careful, we just let it happen. That's what happened with Achan. That's what happens here in Church of Corinth that we see. And, and no congregation is immune to that. We see that. We need to do better about that. We need to talk about that. We need to make sure that at the end of the day, we have to understand no one can hide sin from God, right? We might be able to hide it from other people, but God sees it. That's why I love the story about Jonah, right? Jonah's like, no one's going to find me. God said, go to Nineveh, Jonah. And Jonah goes, I'm going that way. <laughs> And he hid underneath in the bottom part of the right? He's hiding from God. How many times has your sin you try to hide from God? You can't hide from God. That's like playing hide-and-go-seek with a toddler, and all of a sudden you just see shoes underneath the curtain, right? God sees you. Why well, we try to do that? But we do. We instinctively try to hide. Hebrews 4.13, it says, There is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of, whom, of him whom we must. You must give an account for your actions. And so we got to make sure that we're mindful of that. Let me ask you a question. What did the, what did the effect of Achan's sin have on the children of Israel? And then not only that, what did the effect have... They're in Corinth. Let's look at that real quick. Look over back to Joshua. Go back to Joshua. What happened? So Achan took these things. What happened then? God was angry, but what happened? Well, let's look at that. Joshua chapter 7, verse 5. To kind of set you up some, some context here, the next area that they were going to conquer was a place called Ai, right? So, so they sent out spies to go spy out the country of Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said, hey, let's not, I'm going to paraphrase here. They said, hey, they're not that big. They're not that big of a deal. We don't need to tire our whole army. Let's just send this many up there to go deal with it. We got this. They're, 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 they're going to be easy. Don't, don't stress. Well, then let's see what happened. Remember the accursed things that happened and God said, you take that, you will bring a curse, you know, be accursed. Well, what happened? It says, and they returned to Joshua whenever they said that. In verse 4, it says, so about 3,000 men went up from the people, but they fled. They fled from the people of Ai. And the men of Ai struck down about 36 men, for they chased them uh, far from the gate. And you see them just running. So here's the, here's the situation. Now you've got, you know, Joshua here. And, oh, we can overtake that. That's fine. And so they send the 3,000 men, right? All of a sudden, next thing you know, they're running away from Ai. All of a sudden, these people of Ai has the upper hand. Why? Because God's not with them anymore, right? God cannot associate with sin. They brought sin into the camp, and ergo, God says, I've got to take a step back. I warned y'all. Achan sin by taking these items. What was the consequences of that? 36 families were changed forever, like that. 36 men died. 36 families were without a father, without a husband, because of one man's sin. That's a big deal, ain't it? That's a big deal. There's consequences for our actions. I know we don't like being told that, but there is, isn't there? There is. I know for a fact that my doctor here recently said, hey, guess what? You're not allowed to have anything cherry. That's not good for you. Y yes, sir. But I love cherry limeades. So... That's really hard. That's really difficult and everything else. And if I'm not careful, guess what I found myself in Orlando? Cherry limeade. And guess what I had that whole night? Heartburn. 
And my dad or my, my, my daughter was like, what's going on with you? I said, I, I messed up. I'm reaping the consequences of my actions. I'm reaping what I'm sowing. And she's like, are you going to be okay? I'm dying right now. <laughs> And there's consequences for our actions all the time. What about there in Corinth? What was the consequence of their action? Well, go back over there to 1 Corinthians 5. What was going on there? you got 36 families in the past being affected by Aikinson, and now you've got this gentleman here who has his father's wife. What's the consequences there? Well, then all of a sudden we see the mindset there of the church. It says here, and you are puffed up. He's talking about the congregation. He goes, you're puffed up, meaning that you're, you're proud of this. You're proud of what's happening. You're not mourning about the sin. Instead, you're proud like, hey, we take everything even the sin it says that he who has done this deed might be taken away among you and there was a problem there their mindset was they weren't dealing with the situation they let it go for so long that it just became accepted and even to the point where some of the, the people were puffed up or behaving arrogantly and that wasn't good now the congregation is just puffed up and arrogant I don't know if you've ever met an arrogant person that, they're not fun to deal with Right? That's not a good, good mindset to have as the Lord's church. We need to be caring and encouraging, not arrogant. And that's what, exactly what we see here was the consequences of it. Their glory was not good, we read later on there in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. That at the end of the day, he even likens it. Paul says, don't you know a little leaven does what, church? Leaven's a whole lump. Now, I don't know anything about bread. I love eating it. It's not supposed to have that either. I need a new doctor. Um... But you get leaven, what happens? It spreads, does it not? And then all of a sudden the rising agent, and some of you ladies shaking your head saying that's wrong. Okay, well then I don't know. But I do know it spreads. And so a little leaven, a little bit of this sin that you allow to happen in the Lord's church or allow it in your life, and a little bit of sin just as, and we'll just let a little, guess what? It's going to spread, and it's going to take over, and it will be your downfall. We don't want that to happen. We don't want that to happen. That's exactly what we saw that happened there at the church of Corinth. Do we see that same thing today? Absolutely. Absolutely. A lot of times we just don't want to deal with sin. A lot of times we are like, we're very private people. We don't want to deal with that. But if you love someone, you care for someone. Now, there's a way to do this, right? We're going to talk about that. There's a way that you approach and talk to people that are struggling. We obviously know about hypocrites, right? Don't go to someone that has a speck in their eye while you've got a plank in yours, right? We've got to be careful about how we approach this. It's out of love is the ultimate thing. So how do you deal with sin? How do you deal with sin? All of a sudden there's sin in your life. How do you deal with sin that is entering into the church? Or how do you deal with back then the sin that was entering into the camp? What needed to take place? What needed to happen? Well, go back to Joshua. What did they have to do? Oh. I'm going to tell you, church, this one man and what he did, I guarantee you he did not think about what all was going to happen, all these consequences. Look back there in Joshua chapter 7. Look what happened. First off, after these 36 men died and after they fled from Ai and after they're all just kind of distraught and you read there in chapter 7 that as soon as they find all that, Joshua, verse 6, tore his clothes, fell on the earth with a face before the ark of the Lord until evening and the elders, they put dust on their heads and they, they, tore, they were lamenting. They're like, God, why have you done this to us? We don't understand. In his defense, did Joshua know anything? He didn't know what happened. God was with them in Jericho. He was not with them in Ai. What happened? All of a sudden, now he's distraught. What happened, God? I, maybe it's me. What did I do wrong? Here's my favorite phrase. And sometimes I feel like God says this to me sometimes. There in chapter, verse 10, what does it say? So the Lord said to Joshua, what? Two words. Rise up, get up. I like New King James. Get up. Right? What are you doing? Get up. You're wallowing in this. Fix this. And there's a lot of times I'm in my own sin puddle, if you would, right? Where all of a sudden I find myself just wallowing in my sin and not dealing with it. And I, I think there's no other way. I'm just stuck with this and the consequences of my actions. And maybe you've been there before. And sometimes we get so engrossed in, in what we're doing and that we just feel like we just want to quit. That we want to give up. Have you been there? I have. When things aren't going your way. Because you allowed certain things in your life to happen, that you allowed certain, and, and instead of trying to fix these things, we just say, I quit, I give up. Sometimes I got to have God when He says, Get up, let's fix this. And that's exactly what we see here. God says, I'm going to fill you in why all this is happening, Joshua. He goes, Someone took, someone took the things that they weren't supposed to take. That's what's happening. So here's what you need to do you need to go and find that person. 
and deal with that. Remove it from the camp. Remove it. You can't have that. You can't have that. I can't have fellowship with you until you do that. So guess what they did? They numbered them. They got all the families there. They went one by one from tribe by tribe. And then all of a sudden you get to the point where they get to Achan. And there's Achan. Knowing good and well what he did. Verse 19. Now Joshua said to Achan, my son, I beg you. Give glory to the Lord God of Israel and make confession to him. Tell me now, what have you done? Do not hide it from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and this is what I've done. Look what Achan's about to just confess it all right here, verse 21. He says, When I saw among the spoils a beautiful Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold weighing about 50 shekels. I coveted them and took them, and they are hidden in the earth. He buried them, church. Hidden in the earth in the midst of my tent with the silver under it. So Joshua sent messengers. They ran to the tent, and there it was, hidden in his tent with the silver under it. And they took them. Now look at this. And they took them from the midst of the tent, brought them to Joshua, and all the children of Israel laid them out before the Lord. Then Joshua and all the Israel took Achan, the son of Zerah, the silver, the garment, the wedge of gold. What else did he take? Mm. The sons, his daughters, his livestock, his tent. All that he had brought him to the valley of Accor, and Joshua said, Why have you troubled us? The Lord will trouble you this day. So all of Israel stoned him with stones, and they burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. And you're thinking, man, that is harsh punishment. How many men died? 36. Because of one man's sin. I guarantee you if Achan knew the consequences of his action, he wouldn't have taken that. It wasn't worth it. He lost it all. He jeopardized his family. He jeopardized himself. Because of one sin. I think it's interesting, verse 20, I know our time eludes us, but there in chapter 20, or verse 26 it says, Then they raised up a, a great heap of stones still there to this day. So the Lord turned from this fierceness of anger, and therefore the name of that place has been known, the Valley of Accor, to this day. I think it's interesting. Why did they put stones out there, church? Why did they, they pile stones? Is that just something that they do? It said it was there to this day. What was the purpose? Why do we have it? That's not the only time. When they crossed the Jordan River, you had these big stones that represent the tribes, right? Why do that? So that way when little Johnny, probably that wasn't his name, when little Techish, that sounds like a name in the Bible, Asks, hey, granddad, what's those stones over there? What's that about? Let me tell you about that, son. That's about a man who thought of himself, unfortunately. Went against God, and his punishment was this. It's a reminder, a reminder of to do what, what is right. What about Corinth as we close? What, what about Corinth? Corinth, you, they needed to be sanctified back then in the Old Testament. What do they need to be doing here? They needed to cleanse themselves from what was going on there. So how do you do that? Well, It gets to the point where if they don't want to do anything right and they don't want to fix and they just don't want to remove the sin, then you got to say, we love you, but but we're done. we got to take a step back. And that's, this is called the forgotten commandment because it is so hard. Matthew 18, verse 15. It says, moreover, if your brother sins against you, you go and you tell his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you've gained your brother. Jesus lays out exactly how you deal with sin when it comes to a brother. You go to them first. And if he doesn't, then we read later on, you take some witnesses. And why do you take witnesses? Not to gang up on them. It's saying, hey, let's encourage you together that if there's sin, we need to take care of this. We love you and we care for you. Let's let's remove it from your life. If he doesn't hear you, then you go to the elders and say, we've done everything we can. Is there anything else? And then they tell it to the church. And then we see that there's a withdrawing from them. Not a a banishment. Not not a, uh, a mindset of what the Jews used to practice where all of a sudden they're cut off. The mindset here is very simple. And, and Paul likens it. He goes, deliver such one to Satan so that ultimately why? So that way he can be saved in the day. Well, what does that even mean? That sounds harsh. Those are harsh words, Paul. 
That's harsh words there in verse 5. You're saying deliver such one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the Lord. That sounds harsh. Paul's saying the reason you do that is if they, in the words of my granddaddy, if one wants to go flirt and play with Satan, they're going to go play with Satan. But be there whenever they get bit. Be there and encourage them to come back home. Be there and encourage them that, hey, we still love you and we haven't left. And I think that's the big thing that we need to take away from here is this. From Aiken all the way to Corinth, this does not work. Are you ready? If there's nothing you listen to me, listen to me right now. Withdrawing fellowship and removing yourself from someone does not work unless there was love there to begin with. If someone withdraws himself, if we withdraw from them, if they didn't feel any love, what's going to bring them back? They didn't feel like they were loved to begin with. So why come back? The reason why withdrawal was supposed to work was that whenever you would withdraw, they're like, man, I miss you. I love you. And when you have all these people saying, hey, we miss you and we love you. And they want to come back. They want to come back and they want to get their life right. Because ultimately we can't have fellowship with sin, right? That's what we see. And it's an encouragement. But they got to feel the love to begin with. Too many times I've sat in elders meetings. Too many times I've dealt with people in the congregation. And they look at me and they're like, do you not know what this brother's doing? Do you not know what this sister's doing? I go, okay. Have you talked to them? Well, no. Have you encouraged them? Well, no. They're a sinner. I'm like, well, then if that's the case, you don't want to talk to me. Because I strive to be perfect and I fall. We got to show that love. We got to encourage them. Now, question. If I do something wrong, you will be my best friend. My best friend. If I go against God's word, you will be my best friend to come talk to me about it. Right? Bring Bible to back it up, right? But you'll be my best friend. A lot of times we don't do that. Here's the thing. No, no rebuke is joyful at the moment, isn't it? It's not. It should be like a soothing oil, as David says. But anytime someone corrects you, do we like being corrected? No. No, we don't. We get very defensive, don't we? Yeah, we don't like to be corrected. But if someone genuinely cares, and I think that's all about how you approach it, right? You know what we used to be called? We, we used to be called a lot of things. First off, we used to be called Bible toting, Bible quoting. Well, we don't tote it and we don't quote it like we should, right? We should get to know the Bible more. What was our other nickname grow, growing up? What do you think it was? Bible thumpers. Very negative context, isn't it? Bible thumpers. I think there needs to be truth and love, church. I think we need to make sure we understand that, that we can still teach the truth and encourage people in truth. But you've got to do it in love. You can't say, get your life right, otherwise we're gone. That's not the mentality to have. There's got to be love there to begin with. Even Jesus said that. He goes, I rebuke those I love. Revelation 3, 19. So once again, sin is going to happen. Sin is everywhere. And you may be visiting here for the first time, and you're like, wow. There's a lot to all this. I can tell you right now, I struggle daily. I'm not a perfect person at all. I struggle daily. Someone asked me, when does a preacher ever come forward? I go, I'm already here. Just assume I need prayers, because I do. I am not better than anyone. I'm not holier than anyone. I'm a man who's trying to do the best he can and to follow what this word says. But I'm going to mess up. And if I don't notice it, come tell me. Come encourage me to get my life right. Because I want to go to heaven just like everyone else. It is my love for you all. That if I see you and I approach you, I'm going to be like, hey, I love you. Can we talk? One of my favorite things is I go to youth rallies. And guess what happens? All these young people, I love them to death. They're like, man, I'm going to add you on Instagram. I'm going to add you on social media. I'm like, you do that. Just know that I'm your friend now and there's going to be some posts. And I might be like, hey, I love you. Can we, can, we, can we have a talk? And guess what happens? Two things happen. Either it's, hey, thank you, I appreciate it, let's talk. Or all of a sudden, I can't message him anymore. Hmm. 
But I do it out of love, not out of hate. And if it got to the point where you have to say, hey, if you're going to go flirt with Satan, go flirt with Satan. But we will be here when you come back. And when they come back, we love on them. We encourage them and say, welcome home. Welcome home. This hits close to me because I've had to do it to even family. My own family. Where they wanted to do one thing and I said, I can't get behind that. I, it won't, this doesn't allow me. But I love you and care for you. And that was hard. But the reason why this works is because the Bible says it works. We just got to show that love to begin with. I encourage you for this. Last thing is this. I don't know what you're struggling with. I don't know what brought you through these doors today. I don't know why you're here. You might be like, it's a holiday. That's why I'm here. That's great. I'm glad you're still here. But one thing I want to encourage you is this. If you have sin in your life, and maybe you find yourself wallowing in it and not knowing what to do, in the words of God, get up. Let's work together. Let's encourage one another. Church, let's be better at loving one another. And let's embrace everyone that walks through that door and give them an opportunity to be loved because God forgave us. We can forgive others of their sins. Of course, we never want to leave without an opportunity. An opportunity if you are not a Christian today and you want to become one. My Bible, as we read and we study, as I'm sure I could see in your Bible as well, that if you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God, if you're willing to confess that, if you believe that, and you confess that, and if you're willing to put him on in baptism after you've repented in a change of heart and a change of mind, where your sins can be washed away, and you can start fresh and anew and live faithful up until death. That's what we see in Scripture. That's where your sins are washed away, and we can start this journey together. If that's you, let's talk about it, and let's get your sins washed away, and let's start that life in this new chapter in your life. If you have questions, once again, you agree, disagree, I still want to talk to you. But church, let's love one another because that's what we're called to do. I don't know where you're at. Maybe you're a Christian today and maybe you're struggling with sin. Maybe you're, you're struggling with maybe brother or sister so-and-so because maybe you have a little rift between. Let's, let's, let's bridge that gap. Let's love on each other. Let's encourage one another right now as we stand and as we sing. Jesus is standing in my